find the bar wire. I'm Amani Sawari, and I have a national prisoner newsletter called The Right to Vote. I'm the founder of Sawari Media, and our goal at Sawari Media is to bridge the gap between social isolation and civic engagement for incarcerated people and all people impacted by the prison industrial slave complex. I'm uh, dissecting it and giving you all an opportunity to see what's going on in here. This letter is actually eight or so pages long. You all can see this was sent earlier this year. You guys see her name in this one because she wants to be known. So let's get started. Dear Miss Sawari, I'm a Black female from Austin, Texas. I have been trapped in the Texas prison system for 33 years. Will you please help me expose the details about my case so I can be released from prison? Let's get into this. There is evidence and witnesses available to prove my case is fabricated. I was not allowed to put on a defense phase to present the evidence. The police and prosecutors lied about everything. They changed everything that actually happened. They even had the medical examiner use another body. And Sergeant, Sergeant P told the ER staff to not let me see my husband's body. I was not allowed to identify my husband in the ER. Powers and P were determined to make this case fit me because their co-workers were not able to put some cases on me in 1984. Innocent until proven guilty doesn't look like it is playing a significant role here. Going on. Now they are determined to keep me in prison so I cannot file criminal charges against them. They keep getting people to help them. Each new police chief, NDA, State Bar of Texas, Texas Commission on Judicial Conduct, Parole Board, federal judges, and even prison officials. Former TDCJ, that's the Texas Department of Criminal Justice, uh, CID Director Rick Thaler put me on special correspondence restriction out of the blue in September, 2010. She was placed on a status that requires for her mail to be extra scrutinized. So the fact that this made it to me, I couldn't help but share it with you all. He lied that I was sending threats to the prosecutor powers. That allowed the mail room supervisors at the Lane Mira unit read all my mail. They did not want me to send out regarding my case. They lied that it depicted a threat and refused to mail it out. When they realized the correspondence denial forms are evidence of their lies and crimes, they stopped notifying me that my letters were not going out. They started throwing them in the trash or put them in my file. So she's no longer at that facility anymore. I am now at Mountain View and I have been able to get mail out. Will you please help me expose all of this so I can go home? To, we're in Texas right now, but just to take it to Michigan specifically, in Michigan, people in prison are not allowed to mail other people in prison. So if, if you made a friend in Gus Harrison while you were incarcerated there, and let's say this person is like a mentor to you and they're helping you um, understand the workings of the facility and they support you in your endeavors. They help you getting on your feet. And then all of a sudden you're moved to Kinross. Now, Kinross is all the way up in the Upper Peninsula. You can't write them. You can't communicate with them at all anymore just because you've been relocated to another facility. And so that's one of the mailroom restrictions. So... If I were to write my friend in Gus Harrison now being in Kinross, instead of getting my letter, he would get a rejection form or what do they call it? A correspondence denial form. So that would let him know, oh, I was supposed to get mail. I was sent mail. However, some part of the prison's policy where I am is not allowing me to receive that correspondence to me. So instead of receiving that and viewing that, I am forced to read this uh, rejection form. So I have an entire folder of archives that is labeled mailroom restrictions just because I get so many pieces of mail that are denied for no reason at all. And they do get ridiculous. These are what I send to incarcerated people, and they are literally just about voting rights and ways to be civically engaged and resources for people in prison so that they can have a network of support while in 
what some may argue are the most depressed places in our nation. How is that in any way a threat to security? And if your security is threatened by additional pathways for resources of support, then what are you securing that's worth securing? So I pulled out some of the, and this is sincerely signed by Naomi Easley, and she did have some other pages enclosed within this that I'm not going to go over in this episode, but what I will let you guys know is that she has available a lot of evidence related to her case, and she's open to that being shared with people who are interested in helping look into her case and uncover all of its fabrications. Those pieces of evidence include 13 fingerprints, the original 911 tape, the altered 911 tape that was used in her case, as well as Palacio's affidavit, police reports. The police reports, if you'd like to look those up right now, file numbers are 89-309-1670 and 3100132. She also has her indictment, her divorce petition, her birth records, dental records, autopsy and autopsy photos, ER and EMS reports, essential photographs, and a list of witnesses and all of the different details surrounding those pieces were listed out in the following pages of the letter. People can be incarcerated in situations where they are literally more than oppressed. It's more than just punishment. People have to understand that the punishment of prison is being separated. That is the punishment. That is an ongoing punishment. But what makes prison cruel and unusual beyond just simple punishment is if you're neglected by someone, if if you get into a spat with someone, if there's someone that simply doesn't like you, if, if there's a staff, and when I say someone, I'm literally talking about staff, like the people who manage your life. If there's a staff member who doesn't feel like you are deserving of, of nutritious food or going to a different recreational program or getting into a course they can literally block you they can block you from participating in those activities they can block you from receiving the resources they need they can block you from as we saw in in the last episode access to the medication that you need they can block you from communicating with people on the outside and this can go on not just for a couple months just because. So that is exposed in this letter, just the reality of that. The second thing that we can see is that her case involved a lot of different groups within the judiciary process, several police chiefs over the period of time. The Texas Commission on Judicial Conduct, the parole board, federal judges, prison officials, there are all these different entities that are supposed to be like checks and balances are actually working together to, to keep maintaining a broken system and then another thing that i'll pull out of this letter is that the power of the human spirit even being in a degrading dehumanizing depressing dilapidated environment where you're constantly being uh, oppressed um, neglected uh, mistreated misinformed um, not allowed to communicate not allowed to correspond, not allowed to move about freely, where you're constantly in those conditions, the resiliency of the human spirit is so strong that even after 33 years, the letter gets out and beautiful people like you are able to read it. Follow Sawari Media. We have an archive that we are currently in the process of building that are going to hold these stories. Get involved. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. And just be a part of these dialogues and conversations. I'm sure if you forward it, it'll eventually get to someone who can take direct action on Naomi's behalf.